Welcome everybody to this week's episode of How To Be Hopeful. My name's Bernadette Russell. This is my podcast all about hope and how to find it and how to keep hold of it once you've found it. And also a chance to talk to some people who haven't had the chance to talk to during this strange period of being separated um, about what they're up to and uh, their amazing work. And this week I'm so pleased uh, to speak to uh, my friend Dewinda Not least because she's an amazing artist and maker, but also because she's got a really fantastic Wolverhampton accent, um, which is so nice to hear. (laughs) It's such a treat for me to hear. Um, So, first of all, lovely, um, hello, how are you? Hi, Bernadette. Yes, I'm really well, actually. Yeah, we're going straight back into second lockdown, but yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's worth saying, actually, because this this might go out in about 10 days, that today is Saturday the 7th of November, so as we're speaking, uh, we're in the beginning of the second lockdown and we're also still waiting to see the results of the US election. So just to let everyone know, that's kind of bubbling in the background still. Yeah, I've been following that very closely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so would you mind just um, introducing yourself to us briefly, um, just giving us a little bit of background on who, who you are and what you get up to in your magical world? <laughs> um, so my name's Dewinda Bansor. I'm an artist, producer, presenter, maker, creator, all of those things. Um, and yes, as you can tell, I am based in Wolverhampton. I was born and raised here. And um, my my background really is in making theatre, immersive theatre. And about three years ago, I decided actually I wanted to have a chance at exploring the stories that I felt were important to me and also have a chance to explore my own story as well. So I used that as my first piece of work for Jambo Cinema and um, and have carried on. Yeah, Yeah, we're definitely, we're going to definitely cover all of those because I was very excited looking at all your, reminding myself of your work and looking at your website and I was like, oh, it's so brilliant, it's such brilliant storytelling, so we're definitely going to listen to some of that. Just before we dive into that, because I try to um, kind of begin the podcast or the conversation at a place of hope, if possible, you don't have to if you can't think of anything, but I just wondered if there's been anything this week, Dewinda, that's made you feel hopeful just to start us off before we get into your amazing work. Um, I think there's always hope if you can try and put yourself into that mindset. It's um, I actually came across a really brilliant quote by Marcus Aurelius, and it said, uh, the quality of your happiness depends on the quality of your thoughts. But it's something I might have got that slightly wrong. It's, it's sort of paraphrased it slightly, but it's around those sort of lines about you know, how you can you can sort of live in heaven or hell in your mind, depending on how you think and what you allow in. So uh, I think that's quite important to say that. And I think um, I think particularly where we are in history and and how we just can't switch off on anything right now. It's important to be mindful at the at the door of your mind about what you do allow in, and try and allow hope in instead of allowing in lots of negativity, which is in abundance everywhere at the moment, try and find the right things to allow into your mind. It's really pertinent advice, Dewinda, thank you. I think he, was he a Stoic? I feel like... Yeah, I think he was an emperor, a Roman emperor. Yeah, Yeah. I think he might have been a Stoic. That's sort of ringing a bell, but um, yeah, I think think it's... uh, Thank you so much for reminding us all of that, because I think at the moment you can get hooked into sort of doom scrolling on social media and just looking at terrible things but um yeah you're right it's not very helpful and that thing about letting in hope is really important and one of the reasons that I really wanted to speak to you was very keen and happy to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you is I for me your your work as an artist and as a storyteller in the broadest sense of that is predicated on hope and I love that you where you use nostalgia in this incredibly hopeful sort of positive way and act in a beautiful way and sort of work with stories and facilitate other people telling stories for me the particular importance of that is they might be lesser told stories or less frequent frequently told stories um but there's lots of humor in your work which I really enjoy (laughs) and there's lots of joy and just playfulness and fun um so before we get to all those amazing projects which are absolutely joyful um I just want you to ask about 
your journey from a little girl um, growing up to where you are now. And I wondered what, what and who inspired you to become an artist and what obstacles and also what kind of good fortune helped you get there? Wow, that's very packed. <laughs> so let's start with, uh, yeah, growing up. So I'm, I'm the youngest daughter to twice my parents who came to Wolverhampton from India via Kenya and they arrived here in the 1960s and for me, you know, I was the youngest so my oldest brother is 20 years older than me so for me, I really was the baby of the family. Yeah. And so I did my growing up in the 1980s and that's a period that I frequently got back to because my memories of that time, they're so strong and vivid and, um, and, and it was a very free, carefree kind of, brilliant time to be growing up in and amongst around you know being really deeply embedded into my parents heritage and culture of being Sikh and of being first generation migrant Indians into the UK and and my father sort of um, being the eldest and every Sunday was about going to different people's houses or either going to their house as a guest or them coming to our house and it was really about maintaining that strength and community connection um, and downtime and I think um, there's quite a lot that I look back on then that I draw from to pull into my work now so my thing is always like I came across this quote you know a few years ago like you know quite a few years ago actually which is history repeats itself and I'm like yes it, but it does but what can we learn from the past that is good so, you know, we have to learn about things that weren't so good and weren't so positive so that they don't happen again. But then we can always take things from the past that are relevant to where we are now. And that's why, you know, when people come and see my work. They're like, actually, this is this is kind of happening to us now. So I like to shine a light on things that could seem like it's yesteryear. But why is it relevant to us now? Yeah, yeah. It's very powerful, isn't it, reflecting back in that way that what I think you're really brilliant at it is accessing the comfort in that, which is enormously beneficial, sort of the comfort in recognition and the sort of joy in that, but also using that to challenge. I think you're you're really brilliant at that. So that's great. Um, and, and then uh, sort of, yeah, so growing up in that sort of, uh, you know, household of, listening to my parents put on the prayers in the morning in the seat prayers and then you know seeing my mom pray and then my brother who was like heavily into rock and you know was learning to play the guitar and was a welder at, at, at a local factory there was like all sorts of different mixes within their my influence I would say that has now enabled me to put everything together and then put my own kind of lens on what I was observing growing up and then to where we are now and did you all was was did, did you always want to be an artist or creative if some, in some way, even as, a, even as a little Dewinder? I think as a little Dewinder, I was always really creative. And when I think back, I was thinking about the question, actually, but when I think back to the point at which I enjoyed my time the most as a child, it was, um, it was in primary school and my teacher that year was Mr Prescott. And that year we went to things, we did things like we learned about different cultures all around the world. We went to Wolverhampton Market and we got to go to different stall holders where they had different types of food. So there was a Chinese um, stall holder and we got to understand about Chinese food. Um, and there was a there's, there was a guy who was Jamaican and he had all sorts of things on his stall. And he cooked bits of fruit and he cooked mango for us and he cooked breadfruit. And he cooked all these things for us to taste and try that we had never experienced before. So that was such an interesting thing for me to experience at that age because we were getting to know other cultures through their food and so yeah I, I definitely remember being drawn back if I think about what I enjoyed most about being young it was definitely those moments of you know um, experiencing the world in a different way um, which was introduced to us by our teachers but also that well, you will know this that I grew up in my parents Bollywood rental shop and that really was about me being immersed in their, you know, into, into Bollywood film. And so I got to watch them all day long if I wanted to. Um, and then, yeah, we just invited over family and we'd all sit down and pile in together and cook and 
and you know, my mom and my aunt would be in the kitchen cooking and everyone else would be in the living room and we'd all just kind of pile in and watch some film. And it was really a very close communal experience, really. I have to say, um, Dwinda, I did know that. And to me, that literally sounds like heaven. That for me, the idea of watching Bollywood films and all the, gl- <laughs> the glamour and the glory of that and yeah. eating really nice food, it is literally my idea of heaven. I mean, it's just so beautiful. So what an amazing place to come from you know what an incredible place to come from it's brilliant but I have to say I didn't although that was something that I really valued I didn't go into I went to university and I did a business I did a computer science degree at college I did a business business studies um, BTEC so I didn't even do A levels um, and I did that because I just felt that the arts was not a career choice at all and uh, and I needed to do something proper um, and something that people understood. And so I, well, maybe not even people, maybe my family understood, really. Um, and I think it's only in recent years that people, there is, there is that, um, a very clear route to how you could possibly get in, um, well, clearer than it used to be. Before it was like this magical world, and no one could, no one really knew how to navigate your way in. You had to have someone that was going to show you the way. I think I don't know what you think about this, and I, I don't wish to oversimplify the entry point, but I think there is a sort of class. There are sort. Of, I mean, I come from a working class background, and I didn't know anyone who worked professionally in the arts. I didn't even know anyone that knew anyone, and mm-hmm. so no one I knew understood how to get in there yeah Uh, and so I'm really hoping I know there's a lot of work on making that clearer that literally the route I didn't even though I imagined I wanted to do something creative I didn't even understand what the roots were so I think did you have that experience as well do you think not do you think it was about not having I think it's I think it's definitely class but for me I think the added layer is about cultural representation as well yeah so I think for me, I didn't really see anyone. Um, maybe it was more men. I think there was more male representation of Asian men, perhaps. But there, there certainly wasn't much for women. Um, but it's that thing of, you know, sometimes these opportunities, they are hidden. They're yeah. hidden amongst people in the industry. And so it's, you have to know somebody to get in. Yeah. Um, and, and it... So I went, and when you're in, in it, you kind of hear about all these things and you get invited to participate in work and, and you get commissioned and everything else because the industry knows who you are now. But before that point, it's incredibly hard. It's pretty much impossible until someone opens that door for you. But then I do believe, you know, uh, one of the things that my older brother told me that my dad always used to say, which was if someone gives you an opportunity, you know, run to grab it but also prove your prove that you are worthy of it as well so it's a case of you know if someone does open that door for you don't be complacent and just think okay that's fine now it's continue striving to be excellent within that area yeah I think so I think there's a lot there's a lot in there isn't there because it feels like certainly in interviews I've had with other friends in terms of access the democratization of the arts if you like and and representation it looks like there's the beginnings of things improving anyway. Yeah. Do you, do you think that's the case? Yeah, I think there's a lot more of, you know, recognising there's an issue here, but recognising that, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more of recognising that there's an issue and there's a lot more, and I, and I think actually there's things that happen in history that push things along. And I think particularly this year with what happened with Black Lives Matter and all of the protests, that does spill out into the wider world and, and, and it should, actually. And as a result of that, there's a lot a lot of people and there's a lot of, sort of more listening and more sort of let's have the conversation even though it's uncomfortable. Yeah. that Has, made, has that made you feel a little bit more hopeful about the future? Of- it has, yeah, because I think... I think the learning really happens in uncomfortable conversations. And I, and I do think that there is a lot of power in that. There is a lot of hope in that. 
Um, and I think people shouldn't feel uncomfortable about having uncomfortable conversations. They should just lean into it and to say, let's get everything on the table, even though it's not pretty, and see what we can do with the facts. Yeah, I mm. feel that's happening a lot more. In fact, some in some ways, I do wonder whether the way that um, the virus has sort of made our world, world smaller... I sometimes think that has enabled us to go a bit deeper because our world's are smaller but sort of more concentrated. And so I'm having much deeper conversations, actually, with people. Um, and I have access to, to to many less people, actually. But I think I'm, yes. hope, I'm hoping that that's a positive. Do you, do you feel like that? I, I'm the same as you. There's a lot of um, There's a lot of people who have disconnected from sort of accidentally. But there's a lot of people that I've connected with, with a sense of purpose and hope. And I feel that is that is the right way for the world to be moving in. And then, you know, I think it's it, the virus. It, I mean, some people have been affected by it. Some people, the way that I explained it, somebody said, oh, you know, we're all in the same boat. And I said, well, actually, we're not in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. And we're all in different boats and we're all in different situations and positions. That's literally exactly what I said. I said we're in the same sea, but some of us are in a broken dinghy and someone else is in a ferry. Yes. It's like that, isn't it? (laughs) Exactly. That's right. That's absolutely correct. It's, you know, some people, this is the best time of their life and they're getting furloughed and they've already got money and they're quite wealthy. And other people, you know, are, are struggling people on benefits who haven't been paid and they don't have any money to eat you know so there are there, there is a real sort of divide there's a huge divide actually and it's important to recognize where you are in that and if you do have um more privilege than others i think it's important to use it right now for the for the good of humanity um, i do feel that there is an abundance of kindness and there's a big mm. there seems to be a big uptick of people saying look i want to help i can help i'm going to volunteer i'm going to look after my neighbor I've certainly seen that. Have you Have you noticed that? You know what's really interesting, Bernadette? I think in real life, there's a lot more positivity than when people get caught up in this matrix of there's the social media world and, and media generally, digital media, which is it, sometimes it reports things that just, they aren't really that true. Yeah. And it's quite frustrating. And I think that's why it's so important to disconnect from di- digital the di- digital world occasionally to think well, what's actually going on in my in my own world immediately where I am yeah it's 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 true and my neighbors around here so I've we've lived in Wolverhampton and I, although I've moved away to university and taken other opportunities and I lived in Brazil for a short while as well um my neighbors I they have seen me grow up from a child and I've seen them get older and we've always been around this area and like you know there's there's neighbors who are like family, you know, it was that kind of a thing when I was growing up, it was like, um, uh, you know, anyone older than you can give you a good telling off, it was like, it's like, it was brilliant actually, I probably didn't appreciate it much at the time, but you always knew you couldn't do anything wrong because someone would tell your parents and that would be it, um, but it, it, it's a, when lockdown happened first time around, you know, and the weather was quite nice, we were all in our gardens, our front gardens, and tending to our flowers and our lawns and everything, having conversations. And even people who were just walking their dog that I didn't know would stop and just say, how are you doing? Are you doing all right? And all of this. And, you know, there was that genuine openness to have a conversation because we were all starved of having rich conversations all of a sudden and being stuck indoors. But I do think there's um it, it almost gave a lot of people a reset of what am I doing with my life, what's important, and where am I spending my time? Where do I want to spend my time now, now that I have it, where am I going to put my time and effort and energy? And I, I mean I know friends who have just they've just packed in their jobs. Me too. Yeah, they've just said, Oh, I've had enough of this, I'm I'm, I'm I want to live life on my own terms a little bit and I'm going to do something that is important to me. Yeah, no, they're, they're very empowering things. It does feel like we haven't yet even seen the beginning of the profound changes and that I, I feel a lot of them will be be positive, I hope, anyway. Um, 
just because I'm mindful of time to and I really want to talk about your amazing projects and not miss out on that. Um, would, I wondered if you, um, if this isn't an impossible question to answer, <laughs> if you might be able to speak a little bit about what, of all your amazing projects, what might have been your favourite so far, or one of your favourites. Um, and that's I, kind of like asking someone to choose their favourite song. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> impossible, but um, I just wondered if there was something that was particularly sort of precious or resonant or enjoyable for you of all the things you've done. So my favourite project that is probably going to be at the top of the list is going to be Jambo Cinema. And the reason for that is because it's very personal. It's about my family. It's the first piece of work that I did where I realised I could tell these stories and I could do a good job. Um, but because before that I was producing and I was helping facilitate other people tell their stories. And this was the first time I was telling my own. And, you know, it's... Um, it's a dedication to my parents for their sacrifices. And that generation, actually, who came here with literally nothing but um, a few pounds and a, and a handful of dreams and aspirations and and hope, a lot of hope, I have to say. Um, and they made it work, and it wasn't easy. It was really hard. Um, it talks about family. And so, th- so those who haven't seen it, it's an installation that is accompanied by a film and you can walk into my the recreation of my 1980s living room with the original photographs and uh, and things that were packed up actually removed when we were decorated and sort of like then towards the end of the 90s we packed everything up and we shifted it all up into the loft and in, in various places and so I, I i unboxed all of that and a lot of it within those spaces is my authentic material and so um making that and then the adjoining space which is the recreation of my parents shop and when my father died in 88 we sort of kept the shop open for about well as long as we could really but it was sort of shut down in 1989 so only yeah a few months later and um and we retained all of that stock so all of the fixtures the fittings the the artwork from the, the VHSs and the, the, the original VHS tapes and everything like that, we've got it all. So I've used that to recreate the the shop that was commissioned. And so was amazing. Like, it new was, art exchange, what, yeah. What an experience for you. was. I mean, an incredible thing to be an audience member in that. It's so, you know, to be so immersed in that. But it must have been amazing for you as well. Um, where did you place it's, it? Well, it's kind of, it, uh, what, what I think is really important to say is that work, allow work to grow because that piece of work it started off as a talk it started off as a talk presentation at the at the flat pack film festival in 2016 and 2020 is when i got to make the version that it's not even the finished version it's the version that is part way to what i actually do want it to be so i think it's really important to take that risk and i think the first time that someone said to me that who's the artist of this work who's made it I was like I have and then it was Skinder from New Art Exchange and he said oh so you're the artist I was like am I am I the artist um and that was the first time that he said well if you're going to keep doing this kind of work you need to own that title yeah so that was very interesting for me because I've always thought no artists have to go to college and, and university and be trained and all the rest of it but actually if you know how to tell stories and you can tell them so that they're relatable to other people, then you can make art. Absolutely, that's fantastic. And when you, um, when you, the version that you have at the moment that people are allowed to go in and sort of occupy the space, what kind of responses did you get? Sort of both from people, I guess, for whom that time was familiar and for people for whom that was a new experience, you know, maybe younger people. or How, how do people respond I think people, well, people have responded in very mixed ways because I do talk about my father passing away in that piece and um, there are people who have, I've comforted who have cried in that. Uh, I, when, when the space is alive and they're up, I like to occupy them as much as possible because I like to host people. So I invite them in, I give them some biscuits and sometimes I have some tea. And we have a chat, they watch the film. Sometimes I don't know it's me who's the artist until they watch the film. And they said, oh, my God, it's you. And then um, we'll have a chat. And and what I wanted those spaces to be 
and this is called very much what I'm interested in right now, is respectful discourse. So we will sit down and we will talk and we'll talk about family, we'll talk about life, we'll talk about the past and then they will ask me questions as well about how it started and, and everything else and they want to know about me now and, and the family life and what happened to the shop and what happened beyond that. And that second part of the project actually that, that will carry on later. Um, but it was very much a case of sparking curiosity and allowing people to ask questions about another culture because sometimes people are like oh I don't really want to I, I want to ask but I don't want someone to be offended and it's like look this is a space for you to ask any question that you want and there is no offense to anything because I want you to go away with having understood something new so it's really about curiosity, about questions, about respectful discourse, and it's about connection, and it's about them having a connection to a moment and a place in time, but also to understanding what this new community that was trying to settle in and, and, and trying to make the UK its home, what, what kind of challenges, but also the, the great things about family life that everyone can connect to. You know, we, we can all connect to, to being a part of a family at some point. So, so it's about being specific, but then being very relatable. And that is, you know, one of the, one of the very fundamental things about my work. I want it to be about a community or something specific, but I want other people to connect with it because I don't think we, I think that's how we understand people and, and you know I gave a speech at the arts marketing conference last year and I said you know we understand ourselves and others by the stories that we are prepared to hear but tell you know how on, if you can be honest about something in your life it gives other people the permission to also yeah, be honest. Yeah there's a beautiful vulnerability in that I think as well as in sharing your real story and what you said then, I think that feels especially important now, this idea or this offer of respectful discourse. Boy, do we need that, right? We need to sit down and listen we and do. listen to each other's stories, tell our stories, ask questions with, with gentleness and with love. So it's, it's just a beautiful project. And it feels like we need, we need more and more and more and more and more and more of that. Uh, I do, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's really easy to jump on this, you know, social media negativity of when someone doesn't agree with someone and shoot them down and really, really have a go at them. But it's like, why don't you ask the question of, well, why do you think this? You know, let's try and unpack it a little bit. Let's try and have the conversation around something. I agree, something. and I think often that, you know, I know I know it's not always the case, but I feel that often, um, Dewinda, at the heart of it is a fear of something and and yeah. fear makes people yeah. lash out and that's a human response that we've evolved to have so do, do you feel that fear is sometimes at the heart of people's not getting on not getting a lot i think it's you know it, yeah it is fear and i think we're in a very much of a individualistic society which has carried on from the thatcher years of you know think about yourself but i think I think that's starting to turn a little bit now, and, and, I, and I do have hope about that, that that is starting to turn, where we think Me about too, others. I think what you said earlier about um, the, the effect, the positive side effects of the pandemic have been the realisation of how much we do depend on each other, the yearn to connect and the recognition of all that, I honestly believe is, is, is a huge and profound change back to a better way of being for all of us, because... My neighbour said something brilliant to me, actually. She said, I keep thinking about where my dinners come from. She's funny, my neighbour. And I went, what? <laughs> she said, well, think about my dinner. She said, someone grew it, some of it in Kent. It, someone, dri someone drives it. Someone packs it. Someone puts it on the shelf. Someone takes it off the shelf. Someone scans it. So, you know, she... And she was right. Yeah, and she was like... She went... I said, yeah, and she went... I think it was 18 people. <laughs> and it really, I just love that she'd done the maths. Yes, yeah, yeah. And it's also, an interesting thing to think about, really. it's just a sort of beautifully profound thing to think about. And she was like, I wish I could say thank you to all of those people. And I just thought it was a brilliant thing to say. And I think people are having thoughts like that, you know, like you were saying earlier. 
we're re-examining what's important and our, the importance of our connections and stuff. And I think your work really, it really contributes to sort of healthy conversations and healthy unpacking of that. Um, I want you to talk about... But the, but the other thing that, you know, Jambo Cinema, like a lot of my work, it is, it is very accessible. You could say it's populist, really. It's, it's very accessible, but, you know, there's always a deeper reason why it's been made and one of the things that I was exploring at the time of making Jambo Cinema was isolation and loneliness and I remember we weren't really alone when we were younger that's because we had so much family and friends who would constantly come around and we would go there and I and I, I wanted to explore that in that space as well. Um, Asian, Asian Women in Cars is another project which also examines um, although it's a light-hearted film in some ways it also, it, you know, it talks about the first generation of Asian women and what hurdles and obstacles they faced and, you know, looked at something quite hard, which is about patriarchy. And it's not something that a lot of people want to admit that exists and it does exist. And I was like, this is true. Let's put it in and let's do something about it. But again, all of the work, you know, has an arc and it has a high and a low. And that's sort of, for me is very important because the world isn't just made up of very serious things. It's made up of things that are lighthearted and very serious, you know, and it's about weaving those things together to give a bit. Really, yes, it is about giving that person, the, the viewer, the audience member, some hope that something happened, but there was a resolution. And could you explain um, Asian Women in Cars, what that was? Because I was that film, were they... Asian Women and Cars was an installation and film and it was commissioned by Multistory and you walked into the space and it was completely dark. You sat into car seats and the kids loved it actually because they could be the front drive. They could be in the front for a uh, and put on the seat belts and everything. And it was very sensory. So the seats had those beaded covers and everything else. Um, and when you walk in, the film is rendered as if it's a rear view mirror. So it's about the reflection of you us moving forward in the story, but looking back in the lives of these women. And that was created um, as, a, as a tribute to my mother's generation of women. And my mother didn't, although I started to drive, wasn't didn't carry on with it because my father wasn't very approving of it. And then hearing about other stories in the family whereby the car really facilitated being able to have an income to keep a roof over the family's head and being the breadwinner of the family as a woman. But also this whole thing of secrecy about not letting family know that she was the one that was bringing the money. And so there's lots of different stories. The stories about learning to drive because it provided uh, women with a connection, Asian women with a connection to other Asian women away from the family life and the and the the eye of the in-laws who were quite controlling so there's lots of different stories but then we also talk about very funny things about you know um, this, this one this, I call them the aunties and this one auntie and she was I went to meet her first and she was um she had some brilliant stories and she was telling me everything she went oh you know what I couldn't get my license so I, I, I tried the 10th time and I didn't get it and then I thought oh forget this I'm just going to drive and then she crashed the car. And then she said, oh, I crashed the car. And then, you know, and, and then your uncle and then this and that. And then she went into a bit of a frenzy telling me about the story. And then when I went back to film her about it, she her husband was sitting there. And, and I said, oh, what about this story about the car the crashing? And she said, oh, that never. No, no, no. I've always been a very safe driver. And so the story, <laughs> the story changed. I mean, it was still very hilarious. But... You know, obviously, she told her husband when she got panicky about the fact that... Well, it's that very funny, actually. He's probably quite sensible. I mean, it's it's quite a confession, <laughs> even though it's hilarious. I love the fact... He, do you know what I was thinking when you sang? I thought that she persevered for 10 driving tests. Yeah. It's incredible. What a woman. Exactly. I mean, she got it in the end. Yeah. She, she did get it in the end. I think it was 15th time round or something. And... Uh, but what was fascinating about those women was that they're all in their 60s and 70s and they have given independence to other women who can't drive. So they, they set up kind of um, diabetes and support groups and support groups to get these women out of the house who are sort of lonely and depressed. 
and take them to these community centres and they eat together, they have a bit of a laugh, they have some tea for an hour or two a week and it's enough to perk them up and keep them going to the following week. And so they give an independence not just to themselves but to other people and I felt that was incredibly interesting and hopeful. It's beautiful. I really um, connected with it. Obviously I'm from a completely different background but my mum learnt to drive much later in life, Dewinda. She was very nervous. And this, and I just admire her as well for, like, getting over that fear. Of re- yeah. I, mean, I think she did all of her lessons, like, with her arms like steel rods. <laughs> um, but um, I sort of connected with it because I thought my mum would really enjoy a conversation with those women, I'm sure, because, because that whole sort of getting over the fear, feeling that people were going to be like, oh, a women driver, you know, yeah, so there was a lot of negativity towards that, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, she lives in the countryside, so it just gave her a little bit of independence. So I just thought it was a really joyful... Um, I, w- I haven't been lucky enough to be part of the live installation, but I've seen um, on your website the films, and it's just like, I love how sort of mischievous they are. Do you know oh, what I mean? Oh, they are, definitely. I loved <laughs> that. I mean, I, I hear you. It's serious, and it is important to sort of have a look at... Um, you know, female emancipation and, you know, empowering women and stuff. But it's also really naughty. I really enjoyed that. They were very naughty and they were very mischievous and very hilarious, I have to say, and I yeah. loved these conversations with them. And your, but... and your process, Dorinda, so when you start out with a beautiful project like this, um, and, and I'm sure they're all different as well, but do you literally seek out people and have a chat with them if you see what I mean so you sort of in a way it's like investigative journalism your process is it yeah that's right I, I hadn't actually thought about it in that way but I think you hit the nail right on the head it's sort of listening is the key thing um so the very very tiny small ideas come from listening to what's actually happening and what someone's saying and why that's important and I felt that a conversation that I was having with my aunt about, um, can you hear some shuffling? I can, and I can see a mysterious person. <laughs> that's my, that's my mum in the background. My mum's 80. She was 80 two weeks ago. Well, she, looks very, ago. Gla- she looks very glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I look like that at 80. Well, that's actually, that's another thing to add into the mix. You know, I've been a carer for my mum since I was 11 years old. And so for me, that element of care just spills out into all of my work. Um, can you, sorry, can you hear the sound in the background? Can you no, hear it? No, I can't. I, no. Just, I just heard her, she stepped backwards and stepped through and she looked glamorous and mysterious. So I enjoyed seeing that. <laughs> um, I was going to say to you actually, um, Dorinda, because you've mentioned listening a lot. I'm a massive fan of active listening. I think it's really important. But I wondered if that was something that you would always, having been one of many children, being a carer for your mum, I wonder if that was something that you were always good at or whether you think that's something that you've taught yourself to be good at. Because it obviously feels, it sounds like it's a very big part of your practice as an artist. I I mean, I was painfully shy when I was young. I was extremely, extremely shy and I wouldn't speak to people um and I think sometimes when you're when you're a bit shy as well and you've got people who are louder um and I, I, I and I did struggle in the edu- traditional education system as well and I think that made me even more kind of introverted for a while but I think the observer thing I've always sort of stepped back and sort of looked at things and have been I've always felt a little bit on the outside of life and people and relationships and I think because of that it's enabled me to really listen to people yeah that's very interesting that sort of quiet child I sort of connect with that it's probably actually a huge advantage isn't it yeah I mean I was very naughty I was very naughty, I was quiet, but I was really naughty and mischievous and I'd get told off at school and everything all the time and get put on report. I mean, I was really naughty, but I was quiet as well. It's kind of an interesting mix, really. Um, But I I really struggled in the education system. I failed everything. 
Um, it was only when I went to college and I had the autonomy and everything was on me of whether I wanted to do well in life or not. That's when I started to sort of, I suppose, start, I started to fly then. I think that's really lovely for people to hear because I think there's a narrative which is about you have to, you have to do these things by these ages in this order. And actually most people, certainly that I've spoken to from all sorts of background, including my friend who's a cosmologist, they don't have this neat little route to, to success, whatever yeah. that means. And I think it's really lovely for people to hear that version. You know, a friend of mine started a completely new career, Dewinda, you'll love this, at 76. Oh, amazing. At, se- at 76 years old, became an events organiser. I not. I mean, and had had just been a very family you know carer family orientated background so I think hearing that you found started to find your path a little bit later away from the formal school education all these stories are really great and hopeful and for encouraging people I think aren't they no you can do it do it it your own way can't you I think you have to really I think there is it's important for that to happen and I think you know, I did I did business and I did computer science at university and through my degree, I was the last year to make it into the grant system and uh, I couldn't have gone away to university otherwise. And then halfway through my degree, I knew I hated computer science and I didn't want to do it as a career. And then having graduated and got my degree, I decided I was going to volunteer. And my older brother at the time said, what are you doing? You've got a degree and you're volunteering. And so he was really, he was really sort of telling me off. And, uh, and then I found my way into the Birmingham Rep, actually. That's where I first started my career. And I, I did a traineeship there for about 12 weeks and then didn't really look back because I, I felt instinctively that I wanted to be around stories and creativity. And it felt like, for me, the creative world is the one where the individual is celebrated and so that's why it felt like I, it was the first time in my life that I felt like this is where I feel like I belong. Yeah, it's so lovely. And it take, and sometimes it takes a bit longer to find that place, doesn't it? And that's OK as well. Yeah, I think so. Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, I just want you to talk a bit. I'm absolutely enamoured of your We Found Love in the 80s. And I just want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, first of all, to say, because I don't think I've told you this, um, but I was on Facebook and I was a little bit like, oh, people keep posting such negative, horrible things. And then I saw your post about we find, found love in the 80s and it literally flipped my mood around the window. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, it's just for me to celebrate love, to celebrate the 80s, which is this for me is a very joyful decade. I mean, I know there's it's complex. Mm. They all are. But um, there was lots of really wonderful things as well. I just thought it was really fantastic. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about it, about what it is, because it's so joyful. There, so we found love in the 80s. It, um, it started really by me uh, having a conversation in Jambo Cinema with somebody about when they met and they were telling me all about their, their love story. And then I just thought, actually, I'd quite like to find out if there are other couples who are still together and but I'm interested in the tension. So what what obstacles did they come in the, overcome within the 30 years or plus of being together, and and for them to work through that? Because I think you know in life you're always going to have difficulties, but it's about how you overcome them and navigate your way through. And you know within relationships you don't have to be there. It's it's up to you whether you want to stay and commit. And so I was really interested in a a number of things. And I wanted to, all of my work, by the way, it springboards from the previous project. So everything that I work on, it has another springboard onto the next thing that I work on. Um, Oh, that's lovely. So there's a sort of thread thread of... Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there's there's a definite thing about that. Um, and so um, I, then I spoke to, I'd, I'd been one of the commissioned artists for the National Festival of Making and I'd done this massive installation over with um, Wayne Hemingway's team and um, I got to meet Martin Ware there because he was one of the other commissioned artists and Martin Ware is the founder of the Human League and another band called Heaven 17 
So I rang him up. I was like, Martin, I've got this idea. What do you reckon? And he went, it's brilliant. Do it. Let's just do it. And so I pitched the idea to Here and Now, who are um, the sort of they're doing this big thing about the 25th anniversary of Good Calls, the National Lottery. And I was one of the commissioned artists for that with this idea. Um, with the Barbican and Waltham Forest and Future Arts Centres and the National Lottery supporting all of that and the Arts Council. So it was meant to be a physical exhibition and it was celebrating the love stories through photographs, audio, film, vintage items and concert tickets and memorabilia and everything else in between. Um, But really looking at the journey of these couples and what it is that has, first of all, you know, kept them to allowed them to be together in the first place and then what kept them together and then what advice do they give for anyone who's looking for love now. So it's really got that kind of a, a thing about we've, we've been there and we've done it and we're still moving forward together. Yeah, that's fantastic. And are you still sort of accepting submissions for that? Are you still looking for people, just in case anyone's listening and they fell in love in the 80s? Yes, definitely. We're still looking. Oh, oh great. So actually, if you're listening. Yes. Now's your chance. <laughs> Get involved. Yeah, so we're, we're doing an online um, blog, and uh, on all of that, we're celebrating lots of different stories. We've got 50 that have come through, and then we've had them actually, we've, had, we've expanded it internationally now. So we've had stories come from Finland, we've had stories come from Amsterdam, we've had stories come from the States. Um, and so we're, we're going to be celebrating it and we're hoping to get 80 stories from the 80s. That's what we're looking at now. And we've got the, the podcast that's being released in the next few weeks. And we've also got the soundscape that Martin Ware has done that includes all of the voices and the stories of all of the people who participated with the, the new sound score. Um, we've got the film that was launched on the 2nd um, of October, but there was some sort of teething issue. So we're just finishing that off right now. And that will be um, sort of available for people to watch. And um, and there's, an, there's a blog, so there's a number of different elements to this project which give it that real richness. It's really and nice because it's celebratory. It is, there's loads of places to come in on it, which I think yeah. is really great, isn't it? There's something yeah. for everyone who wants to engage in a different way. Um, but the, the point of it was was to look at those hidden kinds of relationships, relationships that aren't ordinarily you know people didn't talk a lot about things like gay relationships and lesbian relationships and um things that were outside of societal norms so i wanted to shine a light on that as well as celebrating everything else in between oh it's so lovely i can't wait i mean it's just going to be so rich um, i think it'll carry on it has yeah. the it really does have that kind of a, an energy I bet there's um I bet the photographs from the eighties have been very enjoyable. They've been really hilarious, actually. <laughs> I mean, some some absolutely terrible haircuts. I mean, really, really, people just cutting their own hair and. You know, I kind of think though, you know, you really should have had at least one terrible experimental haircut in your life. You need to have done that. Yes. Then you, know, <laughs> then you know you've lived. You know. Have you done that? I've you... had oh my, well I've had every kind of colour, every kind of everything. I'll send you some pictures actually. Yes, <laughs> and, but I wondered if I don't know if you'd be able to share, so uh, forgive if you can't, that's absolutely fine. But I wondered if you've had a sort of story that's really touched you from the stories that you've heard so far in this project, or one that's really made you laugh, or one that's made you really smile. Um, I think the stories Oh, that's really interesting. There's so many. Um, because these the couples that I met, so we had a couple from Czech Republic, um, who I thought just actually it was called Yugoslavia then, who talk about their love story. And we've got a couple who are, it, well, they're all mixed relationships. It really does give a breadth of diversity. And that was actually cast in a very deliberate way. So when all the stories were coming into me, I was like, actually, I really want to be celebrated. There was a number of things I was looking for. And one of the things was about representation of diversity. And Ian and Ian, actually, I'll pick them. Ian and Ian, um, the two Ians, um, they they met in the early 80s in a club in London called, um, well, it's a night called Asylum. I think it, the club was called Heaven. And it was one of the Ians 
had spotted the other one in a club and he really, really fancied him and thought he was gorgeous. Um, and he's tried to get his attention three or four times and the other in wasn't having any of it. Um, and then he spotted him on the tube and he started to get his, tried to get his attention on the tube and he still wasn't having any of it. And then, so Ian said, right, I'm going to give it one more go when I spot him. And if it doesn't work after that, I'm going to just give up. And then it turned out the third, like third or fourth time that he tried that it, actually they hit it off and they have been together ever since. They've been together for 36 years. Wow. And what was so interesting about what he said, he said, you know, I wasn't really expecting anything to happen. We adored each other. And um, the Ian that chased the other Ian, he said that he knew straight away that this was someone he wanted to be with. He just felt it instinctively. Um, and they, uh, they, they fell in love. They stayed together. They moved in very quickly. And they then started, because they had a, a love for vintage clothing, they now have their own shop and they've had a business together. They've been in a relationship together. And then when it was time to get married, they also got married a few years ago because they said marriage was never, ever open to them. So it was really hopeful about how things were changing and all of a sudden the inequality that had existed in the past had been corrected. Yeah. Um, and they're just really lots of, they're just really fun people and incredibly loving and kind. And all of the couples that I've met, I feel like they've become friends. Oh, that's so nice to window. I feel like if I had an issue, I could easily go to any one of them and say, oh, I've got this going on, and they would listen to me. It's incredible. Um, well, that's credit to you as well for being such a warm and open person, you know, because that, that doesn't happen in in all circumstances. That doesn't happen with all projects. So that's about you as well, being being a, a really friendly person. So, But how lovely, I think... That's the best you can hope for, isn't it? That as well as having this beautiful connection and telling people stories, that you also get a load of new friends. Well, what? absolutely. And But the thing is, from this conversation with Ian and Ian, you know, and, and all of the other couples, I learned so much. I learned so much because it, they, they were adults in the 80s. I was a child, and so my lens and my experiences are completely different. And, of course, being Indian and being English and everything else was you know, we had different worlds. And so for them to allow me into theirs and for me to learn about things like, you know, what was happening with love and relationships and politics and environment. And, you know, they talk about one of the most inspiring things that they said to me was that, in, you know, in, in the 80s, there was the AIDS pandemic, epidemic. And they talked about how when a lot of gay men were getting sick, it was the lesbians who came to their rescue and looked after them, and it actually united those two groups that previously didn't really connect. And um, and he talked about all sorts of things that happened, good things that happened as a result of the adversity that people were under, and oh, and uh, you know what what opportunities can come through as a result of something very negative. It's another example of what we've been talking about is happening right now with the diversity leading us to connect with each other yeah. and the positives that can come out of that. And it's lovely, I think, seeing that thread, that really beautiful thread throughout history of in difficult times, actually, we do step up. Yeah. We, 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 do, we do do that. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh, well, um, hopefully that people will be listening and they're going to get, get involved with this. Um. I've got a couple of other things for you which are quite big questions to win. <laughs> and one of them is if um I just like to uh, this is a cheeky question and I like to ask everyone this, but if Dewinda you could invent your perfect future, the the uh Dewinda version of Utopia or a Utopia ish, uh Wolverhampton, let's say, let's take it down to your area, Wolverhampton. <laughs> And you might think it already is utopia, so absolutely, that's that's fair enough. What what would that look like or be like for you? What what changes would you like to see to make it to make the wonderful Wolverhampton even more utopian than it already is? Um, I think I think food should be free. I think food should be free. I think we should have this encouragement of. Um, and there's another quote, which is, you should tend to the garden, tend to the, tend to your own garden or something like that. So it's that sort of 
you know, people focusing very much hyper-local on their own area and making it completely amazing. So that would be about skill sharing. It would be about practical skill sharing and how you can help each other. It would be about planting trees and helping each other plant gardens where you could grow your own food. Because I think, because food is free, food is actually free if you know how to grow it and you know how to cook. All of these types of things, I think, are really important life skills to be able to have a good life. So, yeah, I mean, I just love the idea of just walking out in the summertime and just being able to walk along the streets and just pick pears and cherries and apples. And... Yeah, it'd be really nice, was not it? There's amazing projects that I came over all over the world where people have taken over like really scrappy bits of land you know there's always bits in towns aren't there that have just abandoned and turned them into food gardens there's loads in LA actually that's amazing that's yeah. amazing and, I, and like the, the point at which the reason why I say about food is because I don't know if you know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs Maslow was a psychologist and, and passed away in the 70s but he came up with this pyramid and it was all about the psychological and physiological needs. And if you've got things like food and water and your shelter covered and all of those types of things, um, then you can move on to doing other things in society. But if you're just struggling to even eat and you haven't got anywhere to live and you're cold and you're poor and everything else, so it, I think it's very much for me about how do we make sure that we can all live instead of how do we make sure that some people live extremely well and some people don't. And... And I would love to say, if there is, a, if there is ever a possible way to do this, I would like to make sure that the Back to the Future time machine could be invented. Because <laughs> I love that film. That's one of my favourite films, and I was fascinated by it with it, by that whole sort of thing about being able to go back in time and see things um, and experience them all over again, and uh, and have a sneak peek into what was really happening in the world. <laughs> Which is kind of what you do. You are a time traveller. I am, yeah, yeah, I am. I am. I've always been fascinated by time travel and sci-fi and everything else. I mean, you know, um, anything that takes you into a brand new, different world that you can explore, I'm sort of, you know, that's captured me straight away. Amazing. I love that answer. I love that your answer includes growing things and time travel it's, so, it's it's perfect sort of perfectly you um and lastly my lovely if someone's listening to this and they want to connect with your work or with you or to find out more what's a good sort of first stop shop for you what's the best place to go to find you the best place to go to find me is my website and it's got all of my social media links on there as well. Um, so that's dewinderbansal.com, D-A-W-I-N-D-E-R-B-A-N-S-A-L.com. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's the best place. And I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, um, all of the socials, apart from TikTok, I'm not on TikTok. Um, so yeah. I'll make sure that all those links are on there and I'd encourage everybody to check out DeWinder's work because it's just everything, funny, informative, touching, profound, moving. It's just brilliant. And I'm glad, I can't really remember how we first met, but I'm really glad we did. <laughs> well, you know, I, I came to your show, which was the the Ring from 65 Days of Kindness, and I was completely blown away by that show. I loved it so much. Thank you so much. But I thought... I thought we'd met, but it's funny, I remember meeting you there and feeling like I'd already met you. So maybe we met in a past time. <laughs> yes, that's impossible, really. I mean, that does happen, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yes, that's probably true as well. Yeah. I remember that show distinctly. It's still oh. very much one of my favourite highlights. Oh, thank you so much, Dewinda. And it's really lovely to see you and have a, and to see your mum really briefly it was also very lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And you really has. Thank you, my darling. See you soon. Bye. Um.